Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I, I am very happy to present you to Dr. McKeown. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to spell it. Please correct me, Deborah. Uh, Deborah works as an associate professor at the Department of Teaching, Learning and Culture at the Texas AM University. She has also worked as an associate professor for more than five years at Georgia State University in the Department of Educational Psychology and Special Education. She received her doctorate in special education from Valdebert University, where she trained under Dr. Karen Harris and Steve Graham. Uh, Deborah also has 10 years of classroom teaching in various settings, including charter, urban, and international schools. She currently conducts intervention research in the area of writing, and most of her work focuses on impoverished urban settings, where she works at both the teacher and student levels. She is currently uh, in principal investigator on a federal ground to demonstrate the efficacy of a writing intervention combining teacher, teacher instruction and an intelligent tutor to improving writing outcomes for elementary age children. So Deborah, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, you can start when you, when you want. Thank you so much for having me and for the very kind introduction. Um, I appreciate you joining me and recognize that this is being held at a time that maybe is not traditional for you to have your meeting. So thank you for accommodating me. I'm going to speak to you today about a project that we completed as part of uh, one of our writing grants. Um, and so this is a single project. We conducted it as a pilot um, project, and we learned a lot from it. So I look forward to sharing the results of it with you. Uh, what we did is we evaluated the effectiveness as, of practice-based professional development for an evidence-based writing intervention. And we did this with fourth grade teachers and students. The grant project, the Umbrella Project, um, is led by co-PI Dr. K. Wijikmar um, and uh, I, along with Drs. Karen Harris and Steve Graham and Hui Wale, um, are the co-PIs for that project. Um, and it's, it's a multi-year project, and what I'm presenting today is uh, our very first pilot study from the project. Um, the actual project that I'm presenting to you today involved a couple of other people in addition to the co-PIs on the grant, and that is Dr. Julie Owens and uh, Dr. Aaron Fitzpatrick. So first up, I'm just curious. Um, I don't know how Hands Up works in Collaborate, but who reads for pleasure? Can you tell me? We have Hands right. Up. And uh, by clicking on the, at the bottom of your screen, there's an icon there with the hand raised. You didn't know there would be a quiz, did you? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> then who, who writes for pleasure? So whenever I ask these questions in large groups, especially of teachers, you know, nearly every hand goes up whenever we ask who reads for pleasure, um, but not very many people write for pleasure. And it's because it's hard. Writing is difficult. Writing is one of the most cognitively demanding tasks we ask of students. And not many people do it for fun. Writing is a whole bunch of coordinated acts. We have to plan, we have to translate, we review, and all of that is moderated by our long-term memory, our working memory, metacognition, and that is then situated within a specific context as well as community. It's really complicated. So, 
In the US, we use high stakes standardized assessments to demonstrate learning um, and sort of the state of the nation and how learning is going. And we could debate the efficacy of those tests, but it's what we have. And based on those tests, it shows us that most of our students are not meeting the basic proficiency levels in writing. And if we start to look at the writing instruction that's provided, we can uh, take a look at the textbooks and see that writing is not really addressed in any sort of rich and complicated ways. Um, it's pretty surface level uh, and it doesn't really promote deep thinking um, and of course not deep skill development. Additionally, our teachers are really not prepared to teach writing. Um, and whenever they do teach writing, it's usually in preparation for the standardized test. Um, and when they do uh, provide writing instruction, it's not usually based on evidence. Multiple studies have been done with U.S. teachers, and it's found that in the U.S., teachers report providing writing instruction for fewer than 10 minutes a day. And if you go up in the grades, so the older the students are, um, the less amount of time was spent on writing. Additionally, the instruction that's provided really does emphasize tasks that don't really um, demand any sort of collaboration uh, or higher order thinking skills. And Steve Graham calls this writing without composing. I like that term. We do, though, know a lot of what works in terms of writing instruction. So it's not as if we're in the dark and unsure of what should be done. Um, and one of the strongest interventions that we have for writing is called self-regulated strategy development. Um, this was developed by Dr. Karen Harris and has been tested over um, 100 high quality studies have, have been done with uh, self-regulated strategy development. It is considered to be an evidence-based instructional framework um, and it addresses the multiple demands of writing. It is criterion based, it is explicit, and it has interactive strategies and instruction embedded in it. We can teach anything with SRSD, but it has most often been tested for writing, both general and genre specific writing tasks. It does include the writing process, and importantly, the thing that makes it very different from other types of writing instruction is this self regulation component which includes goal setting and self-assessment, uh, self-instruction, self-reinforcement, as well as explicit instruction and the knowledge needed to utilize those strategies. SRSD is built on six flexible and recursive stages of instruction that are provided here. Um, it begins with developing background knowledge um, this is where we discuss any of the terms and concepts that students need to know to make sure everyone is speaking the same language, that we start um, everyone having the same knowledge that's needed to succeed in the writing task. We then engage students in discussion, the writing process, of the genre, of how we plan and utilize the writing process to meet our writing goals. And it's an exchange of ideas uh, with students. We then model writing. And whenever we talk to teachers and say, when you teach writing, do you model? Most of the teachers say, absolutely, I model, yes. But when we observe what they're calling modeling, what they're really doing is showing. And maybe they'll model how to write a topic sentence, but they don't really go beyond that. So if you think about all of the times throughout a child's life that they might encounter someone reading in front of them, including at home and in the community, this is something children see on a regular basis. But we don't really see people writing. We might see people writing a text message, writing an email, a grocery list, um, maybe a check, a thank you card. Not extensive writing like what is demanded of students in school. 
you know, I write for a living and you probably do as well. My children have never seen me write a manuscript from start to finish um, or even a single page of it. So we don't have opportunities in life for children to just see writing happen across the entire process. So if, if, the, um, if teachers are not modeling this from start to finish, children aren't going to see it. And so the modeling portion of SRSD is really critical, not only for showing all that happens through the process of writing, um, but it also includes thinking aloud to make explicit um, all of the thinking and decision making that goes on. And if you recall, I said what makes SRSD different is the self-regulation part. And so through this model, teachers also demonstrate the use of these self-regulatory components by using self-statements. And so teachers model struggling throughout the writing process. They model some self-instruction and identification of the task and self-reinforcement also. It's like, look at that great word I chose. That's amazing. Or, you know, I love that sentence that I just wrote. Or look at me, I'm three quarters of the way through. So we have this self-talk that's embedded into the model as well. So this is the heart of um, SRSD and strategies instruction. The next stage is memorize it. And this is just a tool to help students lower their cognitive load. So we have them internalize the writing process as well as the various components for the, the target genre that's being taught. And that just frees up their memory to be able to think about the creative ideas that they want to include and use their self-regulation to persist through the complex task of writing. The next stage is support it, and this is where teachers pair students or put them in small groups and have them work through the writing process and complete the writing task together in a supported environment where the teacher can still help direct both the process as well as some content if they need. And finally, um, the scaffolded instruction is then withdrawn and students are released for independent performance. Are there any questions thus far about SRSD, self-regulated strategy development? Okay, feel free to interrupt at any time if you have questions. I want to show you just a little bit of data um, that supports my statement that SRSD um, is evidence-based. Um, and so this is a table from a meta-analysis conducted of writing interventions for elementary school students. And you can see highlighted there, SRSD does have the highest effect size. This was for experimental and quasi-experimental studies. And um, this uh, next table is for middle and high school writing instruction. And again, you can see that SRSD had the highest effect sizes. I'm going to talk to you for just a moment about the context of this study. The study took place in a boom town. So a boom town is, at least in Texas, which is uh, where the study took place, uh, is where a lot of oil industry is, is located. And so it was sort of nothing before, and then the oil industry comes to town, and there's a lot of um, economic growth but the infrastructures of these towns can't always keep pace with that. In boom towns, uh, we see low unemployment rates. So because there is such growth in the economy, there's not a lot of unemployment going on. But that is also um, leading to economic stratification. People should see higher salaries, um, and that leads to higher housing prices and limited housing options. But it's difficult to attract and keep the service workers in these towns. And the schools also do not usually see the economic benefit from that industry. And we see higher rates of student and family transients in boom towns. In these locations, we also see increases in teachers' stress uh, because teachers are part of the service industry. Um, but they don't see the economic growth that others do um, because they're part of that service industry. Uh, they 
often experience substandard housing because their salaries do not keep pace with what's going on around them, which leads to long commutes, having to live further away from that town, a lot of economic anxiety, and of course, high levels of stress. And stress, of course, as we know, negatively impacts the working memory. It increases the cognitive load. And we've also found that when teachers are under stress or when they're new to the profession and or if they exceed their working memory, then more recent learning is then inhibited and they tend to revert back to their cognitive default, which may be what they learned in pre-service teaching, or it may even be what they learned whenever they were students themselves. So that older, more reinforced um, ideas and concepts and practices are then employed because it takes less effort. Because we have a lack of pre-service preparation in writing, um, this can become problematic because teachers in these high stress environments will most likely employ less effective approaches. But we know that we can gain expertise and help to um, build teachers efficacy by providing rid, um, flexible and really purposeful practice in terms of writing instruction. And to do that, we use practice-based professional development. This is a model that was developed by Ball and Cohen in 1999, but these same tenets are being played out in most of the contemporary evaluations of professional development. And that is where we have a really strong focus on developing the content knowledge. The teachers see what's being asked of them modeled, and then they engage in independent practice of this newly acquired skill. They are actively engaged with colleagues who have similar learning needs to them while using identical materials that they would be using in the classroom setting. And they receive expert feedback while they practice um, these skills. And in our professional development, we also work with them during that time to help them think about differentiating for the wide range of students that they have in their inclusive classrooms. Um, and then we also make sure to follow up with the teachers in their current classrooms and help them to contextualize what it is that they've learned for the ever-changing uh, student body who they see. From prior studies, um, over 20 studies of practice-based professional development for uh, SRSD for writing, we know that about 14 to 16 hours of uh, this practice-based PD is a sufficient duration to see high implementation fidelity as well as positive student writing outcomes. When this present study set in a boom town, which I've described to you, we randomly assigned 11 schools to treatment and control conditions. And in these schools, there were 17 fourth grade teachers um, and 418 fourth grade students. Here are the descriptive statistics for the student participants. And what we wanted to know is following uh, our practice-based professional development, would teachers implement with fidelity? And would their instruction then lead to improving fourth grade student writing outcomes? And we evaluated those writing outcomes by prompt adherence, genre elements, and holistic quality. This was a multi-site cluster randomized trial. It was waitlisted for social justice reasons. We started by pre-testing um, both treatment and control. We provided professional development to the teachers who were assigned to the treatment condition. Teachers then implemented and we observed for fidelity. We also made observations in the control condition uh, classes just to make sure they weren't implementing um, anything that looked like our intervention. And then we post-tested uh, eight, Yes, eight weeks later. Um, and following that, we provided professional development to the teachers who were in the control condition who wanted to engage in that professional development. 
because this town was very far away from us, it was not feasible to drive there on a regular basis. Um, so we did make trips, but we alternated our uh, team in making the in-person trips. And otherwise, we observed teachers' classrooms using video observations. Um, and we employed Swivel and iPad. And the Swivel is just a little robot that has a tracking device that will follow the teacher around the room and then we'll translate that video captured into the cloud for observation. <clears throat> to measure teacher implementation fidelity, we used a unique checklist for each of those lessons and the video observation. For our students, uh, we asked them to write to an expository prompt pre and post and judge that for being on topic, prompt adherence, um, genre elements, and holistic quality. The pretest is uh, on the left there, and the post-test is on the right. Each of these were the same structure. Students did not need to have any sort of um, external source to guide them. They should be able to answer these questions on their own. Um, that was the idea. These are released items from the state standardized test. And so they had been uh, found to be valid and reliable measures for fourth graders. The results from the study indicated that teachers did implement with high fidelity. Um, we had about six to 19 observations per teacher, but we did have complications with the teacher observations in some cases. Student results uh, showed a significant and large effect for prompt adherence. You can see the effect size was 1.87. For genre elements, the effect size was 0.84 and for holistic quality was 0.87. And there were no significant moderations by gender, um, SES, or race and ethnicity um, on any of the, the pretest scores. Here are the fidelity scores per teacher and per lesson. So you can see the lessons zero through eight. These are the number of observations. And then the teachers are listed here. So you can see the range that we had for teachers, but then also the percentage that was observed for them. These are the descriptive statistics on our outcome measures for students for intervention and control at pretest and post test. I won't make you memorize any of those. <laughs> Here are a couple of examples of student writing pre and post. It's not only about the length, it's also about the ideas that are presented. So in this example, you can see that there's a little bit of a length difference, but more importantly, um, after intervention, it's more organized, it's more clear, it's more targeted. So what does it all mean? Prompt adherence is, is a concept that we usually capture in our analytic um, or elements rubric. But we don't really separate it out and report it. Um, and so I wanted to do that because there's such an emphasis on state standardized testing. And we found a really high effect what was interesting is that the control school group level data showed that their scores on prompt adherence actually decreased at post test. Um, so I don't think that it's common to teach so explicitly analyzing the writing prompt and ensuring that students plan their writing to address all parts of that writing prompt. And for writing quality, we saw strong effect sizes that are similar to other SRSD research, including that implemented by teachers, not just researchers. Um, and there was no significant difference amongst gender, um, social economic status, uh, English learner status, or disability status. Oddly enough, in writing, we normally see gender um, 
as a moderator, and we didn't see that in this study, and I'm really not sure why. That's a head scratcher. Another interesting finding that we had from this study is the treatment classes who started with the lower pretest scores benefited slightly more from the intervention than those with higher pretest scores. And that was on both prompt adherence and holistic scoring. So the SRSD classes, the treatment classes that started with, with the lowest prompt adherence and holistic quality scores made greater gains overall on these measures than those who started with higher scores. Um, and it was a little bit more pronounced on the holistic quality outcome than prompt adherence, but we saw it in both. Um, and maybe this, maybe this is associated with building a writing community. Um, we're not sure. We didn't set out to exactly test that, but it, it's an interesting finding. For teacher fidelity, we did have high fidelity. The lowest average fidelity for teachers was 82%, and that was on lesson three. Lesson three is where we're emphasizing the analysis of other models. So we're picking apart other people's writing to identify the genre elements to be sure that they make sense. And a key part of that is to teach note taking and moving away from this idea that we're going to plan our essays with whole sentences. We model taking just brief notes uh, in order to decrease the overall effort of planning the writing. And what we found in this lesson is, it's what lowered the fidelity, is that many teachers were not actually taking notes. In prior SRSD studies where teachers were implementing, our lowest fidelity was typically on lesson four, which is the modeling lesson. And this is understandable. It's uncomfortable. It's complicated. It has a lot of steps. But because we knew that that's typically the most um, difficult lesson for teachers to do, I increased our fidelity observations across those modeling lessons. And I theorized that because we were observing more, but we got higher fidelity. We did have some challenges with the video observations. Some of that was technology infrastructure. Um, we had two teachers who didn't have Wi-Fi access in their classroom the entire time that we were there. The IT folks could just never get it resolved. Um, but also, the teachers who incorporated the video observation into their routine they received more feedback than those who did not, because every time a teacher would upload a video for us, we watched it for fidelity and then we gave them feedback uh, on it. So every time they uploaded a video, then they got additional feedback, which means those who uploaded more videos received more feedback from us. Um, and there was some resistance to being observed. Now, we see some resistance typically in every study that we do. It's normal. Our teachers have varying levels of comfort with folks being in their room. Uh, but we saw a couple of folks who were really resistant. There was one teacher um, whose data ended up not being included because of, uh, of too many students missed their post test. And so there, we just we couldn't impute that much data for her. So she was removed from the final analysis. But she had a lot of interesting lessons to teach us um, in that she acted like she couldn't use the technology. It made her really uncomfortable. We would show up to do in-person observations at her request, and then she would be teaching something that was not SRSD. She taught grammar one time. Um, it was a host of issues that she presented that was interesting for us to learn from. And uh, so now we need to start doing um, an analysis before we start about technology availability and maybe be a little more transparent um, with teachers about what observations look like. I mean, we tell them, we show them our checklist, uh, we get their buy-in for doing observations, but I think maybe we need to a little bit more than that to make sure they're comfortable. Another finding was teacher stress. I know that I started with boomtowns and that's probably, you know, sort of a weird construct to hold um, in your mind for situating a study. But it's important because of the stress and experiences the teachers had in this town. During our study, we had teachers who left the schools 
because they were offered much higher paying jobs out in the oil fields. Um, one teacher was a participant in our study and she left under these conditions and she never notified the school or us. She just left. Um, and what that meant every time that it happened is that the students in those classes needed to be redistributed to the other teachers who remained because you can't get substitute teachers. You, know, you, you could work at a fast food restaurant in this town and make more money than teachers did. So this increased the workload on teachers. Of course, it's destabilizing to students. I mean, it's a little bit of a traumatic event to have your teacher just leave. Um, so it created an, an environment of uncertainty, which increased anxiety. And teachers express, express to us um, their uncertainty and their concern about finances and housing. And at the end of the school year, there were four teachers in our study who actually left the district. Why does this matter? You think about it, these conditions in boom towns are similar to what we're seeing in schools during COVID. Teachers were exiting often without notice and for an unpredictable duration of time. In those cases, students need to be distributed. It increases the workload on the teachers who remain. Substitute teachers are not available, um, which creates uncertainty and anxiety. And teachers are expressing a lot of uncertainty and fear. And in the US, at least, teachers are leaving the profession in droves. <clears throat> So looking toward the future, what the study taught us is that we probably need to increase our community of support and make sure that teachers build their network amongst each other um, as well as uh, with us. That we probably need to collect some qualitative data on observation resistance and learn more about teachers' concerns in terms of being observed. And we need some systematic implementation plans to address possible barriers of implementation. And what we also learned is that principals need to be engaged in supporting the professional development and the implementation of evidence-based practices. If you would like to take a moment and share how you learned to write, you can go to this little website or click on, um, it should leave you a little padlet um, that's interactive and you can share. But um, I think I'm on time and I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Debra. It was really interesting. So uh, if anyone has a question, you can click uh, on, on, the, on the icon at the bottom of your screen or just unmute yourself and ask uh, the question. So it seems, okay, Erica? Yeah, Erica? Yes, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Debra, for your presentation. That, that I can hear my sound. I don't know if, okay, but um, that was really interesting. Uh, I, I joined the session a bit later, so I don't know if I'm asking questions that you already uh, addressed. Uh, if so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to um, look at the um, recording later. But um, so first of all, this concept of Boomtown, uh, I was not familiar with that, and that was really, really interesting for me. Um, and uh, um, when you and and also the the parallel that you were making with COVID, that that's really interesting uh, uh, to think about uh, uh, these dynamics. Uh, where uh, why did you decide it and to um, target the boom town since the beginning? Uh, I don't know if you mentioned this or. Uh, I did not mention it, and thank you for your question and for attending today. So I did not seek doing research in a boom town. <laughs> it, it is not an easy setting in which to work. Um, it was actually the school district that reached out to our team, and they wanted help 
with writing and writing instruction. Um, in the U.S., a lot of decisions are made based on the state standardized scores in literacy. Um, and in fourth grade, writing is one of the, the tested grades in fourth grade, and they were not succeeding. They were not seeing growth from year to year and, ha and it had been historically not seeing growth. And so they really wanted to try something that they believed would improve the outcomes on the standardized test. Now, this is not why I go in and work with teachers and students, um, but it is oftentimes the gateway to getting in. Um, if you say, I think that we can address your state standardized writing test scores. In addition, they will just learn to write well, which is the more important thing, right? It's to, to become an engaged citizen, to be able to write, to advocate for yourself, to make history deal with your ideas. I'm um, like, this is why we write. Um, but oftentimes in the US, the gateway for researchers to get in is to, to move the numbers on metrics like this. And, and this must answer my second question that would be around recruitment. When I look at the, your number, you have a huge number there and it makes sense now because it was the district that uh, um, reached out for you, right? And gave access to all the schools. Uh, uh, that, that makes sense. But that was very impressive for me to look at those numbers. It is great to see this kind of studies. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing them. Um, You're welcome and keep posted. We have two more studies coming out that has thousands of students participating. Wow, that, that's great. <laughs> um, I, I have a few, uh, another question, but I, I'm going to give others the time if they, in the meantime, they had any other, they want to comment. Uh, I don't know if anything is on the chat. So I'm going to mute myself uh, and then I may, may come back later. Thanks. Thank you, Rita. Do we have any more questions? I think Erica, if you have another question, you can you can ask. Yes, it was related to that point that you were making when you were doing the discussion related to the fact that you didn't find a difference in, in the gender when it comes to the outcomes of the writing. Um, I'm really not familiar with studies that are related to writing. What do you usually see in the literature? What is the difference between the gender? Nearly always we see that females have stronger outcomes than males. Nearly always. It is so odd to have this many students. And so we have the power to detect um, and not see a difference based on gender. It's very odd. It's interesting but I can't explain it. <laughs> Do you think that the use of the, the uh, social media has, an, has had an impact on this in the way uh, students express themselves, uh, not just with writing, but then it has an impact on how they structure their writing later on? I don't know. Could it be possible? It's a great question. I mean, there is certainly um, a higher demand for writing in the social setting amongst children these days. It's not the writing that we, of course, expect in school, but there is something to this thinking in words that must be written um, that I do think is different than in a social context we rely solely on oral communication. It's, it is a very interesting question, and I bet we could quantify it, you know, by collecting the use of written social media and see if that you know moderates writing outcomes or something like that um, I don't know but it's great <laughs> what I want to see is I want to see no differences amongst any any subgroups I want to see everyone responding to instruction in a similar manner everyone benefiting equally that's the dream so I love these outcomes I just can't explain it because it's different than what we've seen before. That, that's okay. great. Uh, um, sorry, Nadina, did you want to ask another question? No, no, sorry. You can uh, 
just because we are here, Deborah, I'm just going to ask the last one and then um, uh, I'm going to. It was really interesting to see the, the professional development scheme that you shared with us um, at some point. It was uh, that six point, I think. Uh, and you were talking about uh, teachers being in contact with each other and using the same material. So how do you create this kind of community and 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 um, keep them living, uh, especially considering this, uh, the number of teachers that are coming in and leaving the, the, the field. Um, what, uh, how do you do that? How do you manage uh, to create this kind of community? This is a great question, and I love that I get to talk about it with you. Um, so across years, we have slowly improved at developing this community. And our research team actually has multiple um, large-scale funded grant studies, some in reading, some in writing. And because we have both, both of those things going on, we're working with a lot of teachers across space. And we have gotten much better by learning from each of the projects how to bring teachers together. So that's the context for how we're learning. Now let me tell you how we're doing it. Um, one, during COVID, we offered teachers professional development that was just optional. It was online and it was about bringing them together, um, doing a lot of community sharing and giving them space to talk about what was going on in their classroom. So this builds a certain amount of trust with us, um, but also some emotional resilience because you, you realize that you're not alone and you have a space to talk about it. So that's foundational. That carried on. Um, to now where for each of our projects, we have a weekly meeting via Zoom that teachers are welcome to, to log in. We usually have 10 to 20 minutes of sharing a new tool or a new resource or um, something that we're seeing in the classroom that we need to sort of redirect or reshape for people. And then the rest of the time is to answer their questions. And so they can bring in like, I have a student who's not responding this week, what should I do? Or I have this text that we're going to deal with next week. I'm not sure how to weave writing into it. Can you talk me through it? And so there's that open forum every week and we record that and post it for those who can't come. We also have a newsletter for each of the projects that we send out each week. And part of that is reporting on performance data, so the fidelity observations that we've collected. We report that, of course, anonymously and collected so that they can see how their district is doing as a whole. We usually include some highlights. So there's a picture of a teacher or students or student work or something like that and give shout outs to people who are doing fantastic things. And so people want to open the newsletter to see who's featured or what's featured. Um, and then we in there talk about the upcoming schedules for observations and again, highlight some tools um, that we include. This is the space where we usually um, highlight our emergent bilingual based tools um, because that's not directly part of the studies, but we support and serve those populations as well. Um, and then finally, in the summers, we are holding institutes to bring all of the teachers together. And we include some of the teachers who have um, provided the intervention in the past. We ask them to come and also provide part of the professional development. And we ask them to help us in creating materials for the next iteration so that the materials that we're using are grounded in their context. This is great. Uh, you're giving us a lot of good inputs and good ideas that we can uh, start from. That's amazing. I really like the, the very beginning when you talk when you talk about the way you created a safe environment for teachers to come and ask questions. I think that this is sometimes, uh, as you we are saying, that's the, the basis, right? They need to feel safe um, in order to ask questions and. and to bring what is challenging um, and to discuss with each other. Uh, that's really, really good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and keep in mind that writing is, a, is an act of vulnerability. It's kind of scary to write. Um, it's not something that teachers are comfortable with. 
And so we're asking them to write in a public performance sort of space. Um, and that's, it's not comfortable and they're not prepared to do it. And that's also a scary thing for a teacher to say, I don't know how to do this. So we, it is important that we make it safe for teachers to say, I don't know, and make mistakes and say, this is really scary. Like, let's put a name to those emotions. So we address that very explicitly in our professional development and just keep it going. Um, there's no place for, for shaming. Uh, there's a whole lot of place for feeling the discomfort of not knowing and growing through that discomfort. And they come out on the other side confident. It's fun. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Well, I think there are no more questions. I agree with Erica that that, that way to do the things with teachers, it's a, a really nice idea and method because that way we, you can use research to in, help them with their practices and also in a, in a safe manner for them not to feel like uh, they are being assessed only. So I, I think it's really nice uh, to hear that work, yeah. 